we actually get more of his life and how he lived his life and the faith that he lived by um, from the moment that he began to do the work that God had called him to do forward. And so he became a, I mean, a treasure, if you would, of Israel. He, he's a name that when you talk about Israel, he should be probably the first name that pops into your mind because he is such an integral part of who they are and uh, them becoming the nation that they are. Now, we get Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I'm not discounting that, but when we talk about Moses, we're talking about the one who delivered them out of Egypt, brought them basically to the promised land, uh, initiated their going into the promised land, even though he himself didn't go. Um, He is the one that God chose to give them the law. He's the one that God chose to lead and guide them, give them all the instructions. And in reality, all the things that took place in the promised land had been passed down from Moses to Joshua so that Joshua would disperse those, as Moses said. And so it was Moses that really God used in this whole scenario, in this whole thing. He used Moses to encourage them. He used Moses to lead them. He used Moses to judge them. He used Moses in every way imaginable. I find it so interesting that at times where uh, the, the duties of Moses, once Moses was gone, the duties of Moses were dispersed. They were dispersed to like many, many people rather than just him. He had done such an incredible work just in the hands of God. And so when you look at Moses, you think, man, here's a guy that his life really was given to serving God. Hebrews 11:26 really points some of this out. And it talks about how much he was in the likeness even of Christ. He says in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Now, I find this an interesting verse because Hebrews, of course, they could talk about God in the person of Christ. And when we're in the Old Testament, we never see God really talked about in the person of Christ, obviously. We see him more in the, in the, the reference of the Father, you know, we'll call him God, call him Lord, and a lot of different names for Lord, depending upon whether or not all the letters are capitalized or just one of the letters are capitalized, call him by different names. But in reality, what they're letting you know here in Hebrews is that many times when Moses was dealing with God, we assume that he's dealing with God the Father. But never forget that when we're talking about God, we're talking about one God. And if you're not careful, we try to separate him into three gods, but he's one God. So when we look at this picture, he reveals himself in different person. The word of the Lord, he tells us in John 1, 1, is Christ. So when we're looking in the Old Testament and we see an example where God is speaking, that word is Christ. And we forget this sometimes. I think we we overlook what the New Testament has given us to give us this uh, open mystery, if you would, into the Old Testament. So in Hebrews, when the writer is giving us this, they're doing so by the inspiration of God. And so when we look at this whole picture, what we're seeing is that, listen, it just talks about the fact that, listen, Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ, that is, that he did all the things that God would have him to do, but, but Hebrews identifies that God as Christ himself. He says he esteemed the reproach that he would receive by being a servant of God. He, he was okay. He, he esteemed it. He, he was he not just accepting of it, but he, um, he embraced it and wanted it and desired it and didn't mind that people made fun of him or didn't mind that people might look upon him differently, especially those folks he grew up with in Egypt. He didn't mind that they looked at him and said he identifies with the God of Israel. Didn't bother him a bit. He liked esteeming the reproach of Christ rather than having all the riches and all the treasures that he would have had being raised in Egypt under the care of Pharaoh's home. So what we find is in Hebrews, he just cuts right to the quick and says, listen, Moses would rather be identified with Christ than with the world. That's what he's saying. And so he says he esteemed the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. He's saying, listen, he wanted and desired what God had for him more than what Pharaoh could give him 
more than what Pharaoh had in store. This is all a part of laying up your treasures in heaven. It's the idea that, listen, do we want what God has for us more than what the world has for us? Because if we're not very careful, we do get caught up so much in the world that we want what the world has to offer so greatly that we're willing to obtain that by sacrificing some of what God wants for us. And, and that's a shame. By the way, just to throw this out there, that's a part of that prosperity doctrine. It's the idea of saying, listen, we want what the world has to offer more than what God has to offer. It's the idea that we, we get this idea that what the world has to offer in whatever, whatever aspect it is, whether it's finances, fame, um, I don't know, just to satisfy our own desires or whatever it might be, we get the idea that that's the most important thing here. And so the prosperity doctrine tells us, listen, that is the most important thing. So you want to serve God and ask God for those things because that's what you want. You want to be satisfied. Nowhere in Scripture do we find that. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. We're always told, basically, listen, if you're going to serve Christ, sometimes it means you have to sacrifice the things of the world in order to do so. In the case of Moses, he had to do exactly that. He had to put the things of the world that he would receive from Egypt, from Pharaoh, on hold. Well, not just on hold. He had to abandon them altogether so that he might become what God would have him to be, and he would be hated by Egypt. He would be hated by Pharaoh. So he actually identifies with the reproach and the sufferings that Christ even endured, and he does so, um, I mean, not reluctantly, but willingly. Now, let's take a look at some of those, because I think it's kind of interesting to see, you know, to bring him and Christ together in this and kind of see the two pictures. Because what we find is that the Bible's pretty clear here that they are making Moses a likeness of Christ, and so we see this, uh, help me out, is it a, a, a simile? Is that a simile? We see a simile here uh, in regard to Moses and Christ in more ways than one. So let's take a look at some of them. If you look back in verse 25, we already talked about this, but I just want to make a reference to it. And back in verse 25, it says this, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Um, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, came to earth and, and, and lived among his people reaching out to Israel, reaching out to the Jews. And ultimately, I mean, it broke his heart. He talks about the fact that he, they were sheep without a shepherd, and he talks about um, how they had turned their back, and they were blinded, and so forth and so on. And so what we, they, they were being led by, by folks that, like the Pharisees who were nowhere near what God wanted them to be, who had made it so legalistic upon their lives that they couldn't hardly even bear what they were trying to throw upon them, and, and that broke his heart. And yet those very same people sent him to the cross of Calvary. And, uh, and, and it had to be heartbreaking because what we find is though he came to them and he identified as with man and became flesh, but man rejected him. Mankind as a whole rejected him. Sure, he had followers. Sure, he had folks that loved him. Sure, he had folks that accepted him and trusted him. But as far as mankind as a whole, it was a very minute number. I mean, a very small number. And so when we look at that picture, what we find is that he suffered. He came in order to bring us salvation. He came to die for our sins. He came to pay the penalty for our sins. He came because he loved us, and yet we rejected him and said, I don't want it. Pushed him away. This was Moses. When Moses came to Egypt, he came to deliver them. And even the, even the, the Jews were unsettled with this thing. They weren't sure what they wanted. At one point, they said, man, it would been better if we had just stayed in Egypt. <laughs> you know, It was a situation where he's leading a group of people that didn't necessarily want to follow him. Um, and so Jesus came to folks that don't even want him. You know, we experience that all the time. We go knocking on doors, or we tell somebody about Jesus Christ, whatever the case may be. And it's amazing to me that nothing you can say at times, if their heart is hardened, there's nothing you could say to cause them to think that there is any need for Jesus Christ in their life whatsoever. Regardless of the fact that he came to die for their sins, regardless of the fact that, you know, that um, he, could, he could give them eternal life, they, they don't want to see it. 
and it breaks your heart because you're looking at people who are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire and you have the answer to keep them out of it and they reject it. So that's the picture. Moses is leading a group of people who don't really get a grip on what's going on and uh, just kind of following his lead because they don't know what else to do. And be quite honest, a lot of them are following his lead because they're afraid of Pharaoh now because, um, because of what all's went on. You know, it's like, well, we can't, it's a no-win situation. We can, we can stay here and die or we can run. Either way, it's no win for us now. Moses has made a situation where, you know, we can't win. And so that was a lot of the situation. But they identify, he, he identified with Christ in how he lived. Not only that, but he, came, he became a leader of the people. Jesus was called Master, Rabbi, Lord. Um, he led his disciples, uh, teaching them, guiding them to become all they needed to be. He established the laws and commandments among them. And, through, and, and, and though some had followed, others hated him. And so in the case of Moses, he had to contend with folks as well. All right? Because in the case of Jesus, here he is doing everything he's, he's to do. And yet the Pharisees hate him, doing everything he's to do, and even one of his own, Judas Iscariot, betrays him, doing everything he can do, and, and, and even going to the cross of Calvary, and people, uh, Peter even, one of his closest, it comes a point where Peter even denies that he knows him. Now we realize Peter comes back to his senses, but regardless, we see this taking place in the life of Jesus. Well, Moses was no different. In the case of Moses, he had to contend with the likes of, say, Korah, I mean, Korah was a Levite just like Moses was a Levite. And, and, and you know, he should have followed him. He should have been willing. Uh, in fact, um, Korah and his family were given responsibilities and duties. And yet Korah just decided, who's, who's Moses think he is? Who does he think he is trying to lead us? He's no leader of us. And so, you know, he wanted to take that spot. Well, Jesus had to deal with that all the time. He had the Pharisees to deal with, had Sadducees to deal with. There were always people going, who do you think you are? You know? And so that was a situation. I always find this interesting. I see this in the case of Moses and Jesus. And I see it in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus comes to Jesus. One of the lines that Nicodemus says, it just sticks with me because he says, we know... Now, keep in mind, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, he's a leader of the people. I mean, and he said, we, talking about all of them, know that you're sent from God. We have, I mean, we know that. You couldn't do what you do if you weren't sent from God. So they knew he was sent from God, yet the Pharisees as a whole, not necessarily Nicodemus, but the Pharisees as a whole turned on him and hated him throughout his entire ministry, screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And you know, paying off Judas Iscariot and doing all the things they did, um, yet they knew he was from God. The same thing happened to Moses. They, had, they knew he was from God. I mean, how else would the plagues have been uh, brought about? How else would all of that have happened? How else would they have crossed the Red Sea and then Pharaoh's armies being drowned in the Red Sea? How else would many of the other things that took place, being fed with manna from heaven, being you know, uh, fed with the water from the rock, quail, uh, you name it, all the different things that God did. They knew Moses was a man from God and a man sent from God and a man representing God. They knew that. There wasn't even a question about that. Yet guys like Korah still rose up against him. Yet the nation still turned on him and had Aaron build a golden calf so they could worship it. Even though they knew Moses was from God. Same thing happened to Jesus, happened to Moses. Um, he actually, Moses actually prophesied of that which was to come. He instructed them how they were going to enter the promised land, how God was going to care for them. And though they wanted it now, um, they needed to understand that, listen, it was coming. They wanted it now, but it was their own rebellion that kept them from getting it. That's an interesting thought, but nonetheless. Uh, but with Moses... He had to lead the people as they wandered in the wilderness. And when Jesus led the people he wanted to establish a kingdom with, they immediately, they wanted it now. We don't have time for you to die and, and suffer for our sins. We want you to rise up and be king. So the people that Moses is leading expects to be able to just go and possess the land, yet they weren't willing to go and possess the land. And the same thing with Jesus. They wanted him to set up a kingdom immediately, yet they weren't willing 
for him to die on the cross first so that he could establish the kingdom because he had to first settle the, 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 the sin issue. And so that's what you find in this. By the way, we'll talk about this in a second, but uh, the idea that he prophesied of that which was to come, you know Moses even prophesied of the coming of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you that in a minute, all right? Um, but keep this in mind too. Moses prepared Joshua to follow him you know, so that he had someone to take the lead when he was gone, uh, just as Christ prepared the disciples. So that when Christ left, he sent the Holy Spirit of God back to comfort them. But on earth, he basically left the disciples that he had trained up to continue with the building of the church, if you would, uh, and to accomplish the work and the things that he would have to accomplish, um, just as uh, Joshua had been prepared to do all the things he did. Um, and, 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 you know, I, while I realize this is not necessarily a part of that suffering, it's still very important in understanding that, listen, it took a lot of time, took a lot of effort, some training. You know, what, all, everything else that Moses did, he also took time to make sure that he trained up young Joshua because he knew that Joshua was going to be important in that role and in that ministry. I've always believed that to be important. My dad taught me that. My dad was one of the best as far as having a heart and a passion to train up young men in the ministry. Man, I'm going to tell you, if you was a young pastor, my dad was going to be your friend. Um, he, he just believed in being a part of helping them and nurturing them. There's a lot of times, I, I, just, I can't tell you the number of times that, you know, I would, I would come in, you know, be out playing or whatever the case may be, and I'd come in and dad would be sitting around the kitchen table with a group of young men teaching them the Bible. He had one group that was a kind of an interesting group. They were Jews. And they had come to know Christ. And he, uh, he had this group of Jews that came, I forget what day it was, but it was one of the evenings. And they'd come every week and sit around our table while Dad taught them the scriptures. And while they understood that and they applied that to their hearts and lives. It was such a, a neat thing to see. And it always made such an impact on me. Uh, Dad did that with my brother and I. When we were called to the ministry, he did everything he could to try to nurture us, teach us, get us into colleges and schools and training sessions and anything and everything we could go to or be a part of that would help train us. It was important to him. That's the case here. Jesus does that with the disciples. Moses does it with Joshua. Moses also had those that he loved and those who were his right-hand men rebel on him at times. Look at the case of Aaron. Moses had Aaron uh, who, well, because he was up on the mountain for too long, I guess, you know, uh, well, I don't guess. The Bible tells us that. He was up there long enough. They got impatient waiting on him and thought, well, he must have died or something. And so they talked Aaron into uh, making a golden calf. And so, you know, here he is, his right-hand man, who should have been saying, hey, listen, this is not the place. This is not the time. We're not doing this. You know, Moses went up to get commands from our God, and we're going to wait on that. Aaron should have taken charge. But instead, he was pushed around by the people and let the people convince him. I don't know, he could have been scared, whatever the case may be. But regardless, his right-hand man, who, who had been with him, who had done great things, by the way, in other situations, in that situation, failed him. Failed him. And uh, we find the same thing true with Jesus Christ. I already mentioned to you the fact of Peter. I mean, Peter, how much more of a right-hand man can you get than Peter? And yet... He denied that he even knew him, you know, when he was arrested. So there is all of that kind of thing that's going on, uh, not to mention Christ in the ultimate rebellion of Judas Iscariot. Here he is, part of his 12, part of his chosen, um, and, uh, and just flat out rebelled, son of perdition, all right? And, um, and you do know the only two people, son of perdition, is Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. Uh, let me tell you my thoughts on that real fast, just for the fun of it. Nothing to do with the lesson, but just to throw this out there at you. Um, that being the son of perdition, you know, how many people do, does Satan actually possess or that Satan actually is really tempting as opposed to, say, his henchmen, you know, his, his devils, you know? I mean, you and I, quite frankly, are probably not big enough on the pole you know, to, to be attacked by Satan himself. We're probably attacked by, you know, some of the lesser an, uh, demonic angels or whatever. That's hard enough for me. I'm okay with that. I, and, you know, let Satan attack somebody else. But we see, the only time we see Satan really rear his ugly head is basically these three times in the New Testament 
when he tempts Jesus, when he takes control of Jesus Iscariot, and when he takes control of the Antichrist. Um, these are, these are, these are, this is a big, big, um, uh, what would you, what would you call it? I mean, this, this is one of the big times where he's going to have to do this, because all of these are for the purpose of either bringing down Christ or imitating Christ. And so this is the point. And so that's going to be something he's going to focus on. He can't be everywhere at once like, you know, like uh, God is. He can just be where he's at at the time. And so he's going to attack and get the people who have the most influence. One of the apostles would have the most influence. The Antichrist would certainly have a lot of influence, and trying to sway Jesus Christ would obviously be influential. So that's where we see him attacking. So when you see that son of perdition, you see these two times where Satan himself takes charge rather than just send some of his cronies. That's why we see when they yield to him, he, they're called son of perdition. So that's the truth. Yes. I don't know. I know uh, Satan will know, um, but the Antichrist, I think, is just following his lead. I think he's just following his lead. So I don't know the answer to whether or not he himself knows that's who he is, but I think he knows, and he knows in his heart that he's not uh, what he ought to be. I do believe that. But whether or not he knows that he is that Antichrist, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. All right. Um, Moses also wrote of Christ. I had mentioned this. He writes of Christ. In fact, we're told this in John chapter 5 and verse 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. So now you might not see that over when you're talking, you know, about the Old Testament right off because we might not associate it with that. But that's what he says in John 5, 26. The passage he's referring to is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Here is what Moses says. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Listen to him, like unto me. Here's the simile again. Moses is saying this is going to be a prophet like me. Um, well, now I've lost my place. Um, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Now, when you're going back in Deuteronomy, we might not gather that right away. But when we get in the New Testament, I mean, it's a bit of a mystery probably to them. But when we get into the New Testament, we find that Jesus tells us in John that he had wrote of him. We know right away this is what he's making a reference to. We see this a couple of times, by the way. We also see in Acts chapter 3, verse 22... All right, this is where Peter's speaking. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And Peter tells us that this prophet is Jesus. All right, and then we get over into Acts chapter 7 and verse 37, and you get Stephen just before he is stoned, and he is preaching to him, and he says this, This is, talking about Jesus, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. So we get three times in the New Testament that he repeats what was, what was taking place that, that Moses had said back in Deuteronomy. And this whole thing is to say that, listen, what Moses said was directly related to Jesus Christ. And so when we get over into John, he makes sure that we understand that that prophet Moses was talking about is me. We get into Acts chapter 3, and we find that Peter says, I got news for you, that prophet that Moses was talking about is Jesus. We get over into Acts chapter 7, and Stephen says that prophet Moses was talking about is Jesus. So we get it three times in the New Testament that, listen, Jesus and Moses are, I mean, this is the one Moses is talking about. So, so Moses and Jesus, are. there's a, a likeness here that we're able to see. Not to say that Jesus and Moses are one and the same, but how Moses uh, was portrayed and the things that Moses did was a parallel to much of what Jesus did so that we could see these things coming and see these things played out. Let me give you an interesting note in case you ever deal with Mormons. Mormons believe 
that 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 they're talking about is Joseph Smith. All right? That's who they believe it is. And, and it's kind of hard, just so you know, it's kind of hard to convince them differently. Uh, but I have had them standing in my driveway talking to me, and they said, you do know that when he says this, and they quoted the scripture right exactly, that you know they're talking about Joseph Smith. He is the prophet that came that's be like Joseph or be like Moses. I said, well, it's kind of interesting that that would be the case when it tells you clearly it's Jesus. I said, he didn't say Joseph, he says Jesus. I said, it makes it very clear that's Jesus. When Jesus says it in John, he says, they we're talking about me. When Peter talks about it in Acts, he said, we're talking about Jesus. When we're talking about Stephen, he said, listen, I was talking about Jesus when I'm telling you this, that Moses said he was going to come. So all those times, all three of them says that the prophet that's going to come, that Moses had prophesied of is Jesus. I said, now, how do you deny that when he says you clearly that it's Jesus, but they believe that that prophet is Joseph Smith? And for those of you who don't know who Joseph Smith is, he's the founder of the Mormons, discovered the tablets, and an angel by the name of Moroni uh, interpreted them for him, and so on down the line, and thus came the Mormons, right? Um, but, but nonetheless, just so you know, um, those are in, important passages to know if you're witnessing to Mormons, because they're going to be taught that, and they believe that to be Joseph Smith, just for the record, all right? Uh, and then the last thing about this between Moses and Jesus Regarding all that he did, he suffered the complaining of the people he had come to aid. They murmured against him. Korah rebelled against him. They had chided him for what they deemed uh, was the lack of provisions. You're not providing enough water. You're not providing enough food. I'm getting sick of manna. I mean, they just, the whole time, they were chiding him over those things. They were quick to set aside true worship when he was gone too long. As soon as they were, he wasn't in their presence, then they decide we're going to set up a golden calf and worship that naked and dancing and carrying on in such a way that we shouldn't. And, uh, and so they did. But in the case of Jesus, we find also that it was his chosen nation that said crucify him. So we also see another picture in that. And so it's the picture that we see all the way through. But here's what we find about Moses. He says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That is... I'm willing to suffer for the cause of Christ because I know what's in it for me and because I know who he is. Now, in this case, he mentions the reward. And the reward is I get to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people get the idea that the reward is something different than that. But when we stop and we talk about all the rewards that are received, keep in mind all the rewards that are given us, we give back to Christ. So what we find is our greatest reward, as he told Abraham, is God, period. The greatest reward is being with him. I mean, for those of you that are in love with your spouse and, and love being with them and enjoy the time together, and you know the greatest reward is not what they have given you over the course of your lifetime. It's having the opportunity to spend time with them. It's the opportunity to have had the opportunity you know, to sit with them and to know that they loved you and you love them and that you be a part of their life. That's what's important. And, and that's more important than anything else. You know, kids will often say when you, they're getting married and you say, well, have you put aside money? Have you tried to build a bank account? Do you have jobs? You, you know, and they'll, no, 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 but our love will last forever. I get that that's really sappy and I get that it's kind of foolish for them to enter into that without trying to make some preparation. But truth be known, that ought to be true. I mean, it is that love that binds you together. Um, now, because I love my wife, I'm going to do my very best to provide for, care for. Because I love my children, I'm going to do my best to provide for them, care for them. All of that goes hand in hand. But by the same token, there ain't nothing better than just being with them, you know, and, and having them in your life. Um, so he says, you know, he says, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. He knew that it didn't matter what the afflictions were here on earth. For all eternity, he had something far better. And that is that we have fellowship with Christ. What a great lesson. I mean, in all honesty, when we look at this lesson as a whole, you think about all the things we go through. I mean, look at the, if you're going to the dentist, 
I mean, what person in their right mind would go to a dentist if they didn't really think about the fact of what was going to happen in the long run? I hate going to the dentist. It's the most painful thing. I hate it. Except for the fact that, you know what? I'm going to come out on the other side without the pain I had experienced. It's going to be painful to get to where I need to be. I hate it. But I look forward to the outcome. I mean, who wants to go to the doctor? you know, or have a surgery or any of those things, but we look forward to the outcome because we know down the road it's going to be for the better. There's a lot of things like that in life. There's a lot of things we suffer the pain because we know how much better it's going to be on the other end, you know. Um, I remember I I I did a job one time back when I didn't have a lot, and we really needed the money bad, bad, bad. And I had an opportunity to work with a truck driver for a week, and I wasn't really working much. Our job, my job wasn't doing much right then. I was, wasn't being called in much. So I, I said, yeah, I'd be glad to work for you. And, uh, and man, it was the hardest work I've ever done in my entire life, I'll just tell you. That was hard, hard. And this guy, I mean, he wasn't fit to do all the hard work, so he had me so that I would be doing all the hard work. All right, I didn't care, because he was paying me extremely well for the day and uh, for that time and so man I'm telling you it killed me and we worked from daylight to dark it was one of those deals where I had to be in work at six in the morning and and honest to goodness I wasn't getting home till 10 11 o'clock at night but I'm going to tell you come the end of the week and he slapped that pay on me I'm looking at that thinking man oh man I hated every minute of it but boy am I glad I did it you know we needed it so bad This is kind of a picture of that. Uh, We're willing to sacrifice great things when we know that God has something better for us. Uh, I know missionaries. I've known pastors. I've known a lot of different people who have sacrificed great things for greater things because of what Christ has given us. Not because there's money in it, not because of any other reason, but that they knew that God was pleased with it and would be pleased with it. And they were looking at the treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. Uh, And they knew that the wealth and fame and all those things that you get here would pale in comparison to what God has in store for them. I'm going to leave you off with that. We'll pick up in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27 next week. All right, any any questions or a thought on that? You've got one minute. 30 seconds. All right. Um, good enough. Guys, thanks again for coming. I hope you're still enjoying this. I hope that you feel like you're learning from it. Um, again, I don't know, some of the stuff we're into these days, I'm really enjoying myself. I, I like the series we're doing on Sunday. This I've enjoyed studying these. Now, I actually, my Sunday school class, I'm really getting a kick out of doing that. It's refreshing to go back and just, you know, nothing real deep in that one, but it just refreshes my memory as to the events that take place and putting things in order. So I'm enjoying it. So enjoying my Bible study these days. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the night. We pray that, Lord, all that we've heard, um, that it make it just more um, like you want us to be. Lord, that we can, our life will please you more and that we'll, we'll be more of the people that you would have us to be to do the things you need us to do. Lord, we love you. Bring us back out to your house again Sunday morning. Give us a great, great crowd. Bring folks out to hear the message. And, Lord God, may there be decisions made in our hearts and lives. Uh, Lord, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.